Hello, after a long break, we're back with a new video. And this time, I'm going to talk about Fold. So I'll start with some standard library examples. We'll try to find an intuition for what folding means. And then we'll actually think about what it means. Then we'll try to implement a fold for a custom sum type that I define. Then that type is going to include some recursion in it. And then it'll also get a type parameter. So we'll look at how to implement a fold for all these kinds of types, and then uh, maybe have a short summary. So let's start with some standard library examples. So let's imagine we have an option, which let's say it'll be an option of int. I'm not going to assign a particular value for now. So if we want to treat this option differently depending on whether it's a none or a sum, because as we remember, an option of a is either a none or a sum of a, which includes an a, right? So let's say we want to do something if it's a none and do something else, but with the value if it's a sum. So I can use the fold function, and if it's empty, then I'm going to assign the my expression the value a in the string. But if it's a sum with some integer inside it, I'm going to uh, map it to a string. So I could just I could just stringify the, the value. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to print the result. And just to show you uh, that it actually works, let's start with a none. So that's an A, because that's what I uh, wanted to have in the case of an empty option. But if I change my mind, if my, uh, my option is actually with a value, let's say 42, I'm going to get the string value of that in my result. So I could have just pattern matched, and that's actually the same thing. I can match on the option, and if it's none, I can say A, otherwise if it's a sum, I can uh, use the string value of that. But this requires me to know the exact structure of the option type. And maybe I don't want to do it. Maybe I don't want to match every time that I touch this type and want to do something with the value inside it. So that's how we can fold in an option. We basically encode a pattern match on this type into a function called fold in this case. OK, so let's have another one. We have a list, which is also going to be a list of integers, and I'm also not going to assign a value for now. So in lists, the situation about the, the sum type is a bit more complicated, because uh, previously we had one case or another case, and that was it. We still have two cases in a list. We have a nil, or we have a cons, which is an a, and a list of a. So this is the complexity. We have a list in one of the cases. So that actually means a list is recursive. It's a recursive data type. So these behave a little differently in a fold. Let's imagine we want to add all the numbers in that list. But let's imagine we also don't have the sum function on lists. So what I would do is say, uh, I want to sum a list of integers. Let's, let's forget about this one for a moment. It's going to be an int. And so I'm going to pattern match on it. So if it's a, a cons, or maybe let, let's start with a nil. If it's a nil, I'm going to return zero. Otherwise, I'm going to add the head to a sum of the tail. Let's rename it. It's going to be a tail. So now I actually had to do quite a lot of work. I had to pattern match on my list and I actually had to involve recursion in my process. So that's a lot of work. And if you notice one quite important thing about this function, it's not even tail recursive. So in order to make it tail recursive, to make it stack safe, I would also have to do some extra work on top of that. So maybe there is a way to do this more cleanly without the pattern match, more efficiently or safely in terms of stack space, 
without the recursion or the recursion in a non tail position. So we can actually do that with a fold. I'm going to use fold right, which is uh, one of the two main ways of folding a list. So I'm going to implement the same function, but using a fold. And I'm not even going to annotate the result because I don't have to, there will be no recursion and the type should be inferred automatically by the compiler. So I'm going to fold right on this, starting with a zero, and then on every uh, element, I'm going to add these two elements. Don't worry, I am going to explain what happens in a moment. And this actually compiles. This is actually stack safe, mostly because the function is implemented using a while loop, uh, but still it's safe enough for me to, to call it on a list of any size. It could be a million elements long, and even without modifying the stack size on my JVM, I can run this and uh, expect to get a result instead of a stack overflow error. So what actually happened in here? Let's look at a particular list and let's try to run this function on that list. So I'm going to have a list with one, two, and three. Just three elements to make it real simple so that I can explain this in more detail. And let's run some fold on it. So what this is going to do, it's going to basically call uh, list one two three fold right zero and a plus and if we desugar this list dot apply or basically rewrite it to what's going to be built up as a data structure we'll have a one a cons and a two another cons and a nil and this is going to be folded that's the same thing uh, we can we can change this. So what's going to, to happen now is all the cons values in this structure are going to be replaced with this operation and the nil is going to be replaced with the zero. So whatever we put as the first parameter in a fold write on a list is going to be is going to replace the, the node at the end of the list, the nil. And whatever we put as the binary operation, it's going to replace the, the constructor that takes a tail and a head. So we can actually change this all, we get rid of the fold right, and replace the nil with a zero, and replace all the cons values with a plus. So that's basically the essence of the fold pattern, or, or the fold function in the general case. We replace each of the constructors of a given type with some value or some function. So, so if the constructor takes values, like cons does, it takes two values, we have a function from, with two parameters. If the constructor doesn't take any values, like nil, because it's a constant, it's an object, we just have a constant. And that's actually the same in the case of option. In the case of option, we had either no arguments just a none, which is an object, or one argument. And our lambda, our function here, actually got one parameter, and the first argument didn't have any parameters. So again, to summarize, a fold is basically replacing all the constructors of a type with functions and values. And I can prove this to you by replacing each of the nodes, each of the constructors of a type, with the same type. If we do that on a list and replace uh, and use a nil as the zero, I'm going to use list empty because it has better type inference. And instead of the plus, I'm going to have a cons. Well, what turns out is that this is going to build up the same list. So that's exactly what happened. All the constructors were replaced with themselves with or with other instances of the same constructors and we got the same list back. So we can actually implement this fold right for a list. It's going to have two type parameters. The first one is going to be the type of the actual list elements. And then we're going to have the zero or the nil deconstructor. So that's going to be a different type because we can use a different type. There's nothing that would force us to use the same one. And then we have an operation from a B and an A 
to an LED. And let's call that cons. The result is also going to be a B. And I'm going to make this uh, recursive, so I want I will want the compiler to help me make sure that is the case. So I'm going to match on the list, and that is the only pattern match that we will ever see if we are just using fold right, just the one in the implementation of it. So because we got a constructor that's the cons, we will need to apply the cons function, but we are not going to apply it just to uh, just to these two values, because well, I can apply it to one to a. Uh, uh, I have a head. I have an A, but I need to use this nil value somewhere. So I'm going to use it here as the first argument of the const function. But that's not all I need to do because even if I get this thing to compile, first of all, I don't have any recursion here. And also, I forgot completely about the rest of my list, so I still need to take care of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the same function, fold right list, with the, the rest of the list, the tail, if you will. And as the current nil, or maybe the current accumulated value, because that's what it actually is going to be, I'm going to pass this result of this cons function, and then at the end, I'll just pass the same cons function again. And for the nil, this couldn't be more simple. I just use the nil value, because there's literally nothing else I can do. I cannot use the list because I've already matched on it, it and it's empty. And I cannot use the cons function because I don't have an A. I only have this empty list and a B from the nil case. So if we call this instead of the fold right here, I should get the same list back. In this case, the order of the arguments has changed. I think I'll need to flip it and change the order in here. Yeah, so I accidentally flipped the list, but it's nothing I couldn't fix. So I'm going to flip the order again, and I'm going to swap the order of the arguments in here. Yep, that still flips the list. So it turns out that what we implemented is not actually fold right, it's fold left. So I'm going to use fold left directly to show you the difference. So what fold left does, it starts from the beginning of the list and then goes through all the list, right? So the first application of the const function is going to be on the head of the list, so on one, and the zero. The zero was an empty list, so we are going to prepend one to an empty list. Then we'll recurse, do the same for the next element of the original list, the two, and prepend it to what we had before. So we have two, then one, then nil, and so on until we have the reversed list. So we actually reverse the list using a fold in here. Now what fold right does instead, it unwraps the whole structure of the list and starts with the nil, the last value in here. That is replaced with the empty case, with the nil case, the first argument that we pass, and then all the cons constructors are replaced with the binary operation. So if we try to implement, uh, actually let's rename this because it's actually full left. So if we try to implement a fold right, we cannot do this in a total recursive way in Scala. Actually, that's not entirely accurate. We probably could implement it in a stack safe way using total recursion, but that would be a lot of extra work to get around the fact that the intuition is not very total recursive. And there are other more efficient ways to implement it than using total recursion. Uh, for example, by using a for loop uh, or a while loop which is actually how foldright is implemented in the Scala standard library. But we can still do it. So I'm going to implement the foldright as well. So far so good, and this looks just like the uh, fold left in the signature, except the const function takes arguments in a different order, the same order that I wanted to have in the first place. So I'm going to match on the list, and now I need to resist the urge 
to call my cons function with the head and the nil. I am still going to use the cons function, but I'm not going to use the nil as the second value. I'm actually going to use the result of folding the other list. So I'm going to call cons with the head and then folding the tail starting with the nil again, the same nil as before, and then the same cons. In the case of nil, I just return nil. Now this is very clearly not tail recursive because this is not a tail position. It might be possible to implement in a, in a tail recursive way, but I haven't tried. Uh, let's, let's just stick to this and let's try it. So I'm going to run fold right list and I'm going to bring back the order that we had before. And that actually rebuilt the list. So what I told you in the beginning, that replace that these parameters are replacing the, the constructors in here, that is now finally true. So that's it for lists. I'm not going to implement this for option because that would be uh, quite trivial. We actually did the pattern match that did pretty much the same thing. Uh, you can look up the actual implementation. Uh, it's not going to be much different from that. We now know how folding looks like in the standard library on lists and option. There's another example of a fold that I wanted to show, and that's either. Let's have an either with a string and an int. And we are not going to find a value for that. So in an either, the situation is pretty simple. Again, we have no recursion, just like in the option case. But an either of a and b is either a left of A with an A or a right of B with a B. So now both constructors of this type, the, the either type, are parameterized with some values. So now there are no constants in here. And our fold is not going to take a zero parameter anymore. In fact, a fold on an either takes two functions. So one, if our either is a string, this is going to be applied. And the other one, if our either is an int, this one is going to be applied. So this is again, just pretty much a pattern match because there's no recursion or anything more complex than that. But it helps us in some situations. And sometimes you want to use this instead of a pattern match. All right, so that's it for standard library types. And now we have an intuition of what it means to fold. So now let's fold some custom types. So I imagined a, a new type called status, which is going to be either pending or in progress with a percentage or done. And if it's done, it's also going to have a completion time. So I'm going to implement this data structure as a, as a sum type. Okay, so we have our type. Now let's define some functions for it. So one of them is going to be completion and it's going to be from a status, we're going to go to an int. So there are several ways I can implement this, but let's say my requirements are that if it's pending, then I'm going to return zero. If it's in progress, I'm going to return the percentage. If it's done, I'm going to return 100% or just 100. So let's, let's match on this input. So if it's pending, I'm going to have a zero, otherwise a percentage if it's in progress, or 100% if it's done. And that's it. It wasn't really hard to implement, but it's still a pattern match. So could we actually implement this as a fold? Turns out we could. So we can define a fold. Now, this type is different from whatever we've seen already because it is not parameterized with any type. So let's let's try to use the to do the simple version. Whatever we want to do on the pending case will be some some type A. So I'm going to add this parameter. Whatever we are going to do for the in progress case is going to be a function from int to A because that's what we have in the in progress case. We have a percentage which is an int. And if it's done we're going to have a function from instant to a, and the result will be an a. And now I can match on this and start with the pending case and just replace it 
with the value of pending. If it's in progress, we'll replace it with the value of in progress. And finally, if it's done, we'll use done with add. So you can see that the two sides of this pattern match are really very similar. We are just replacing constructors of the type with the values that we were given. We can also make this one a by name parameter so that it's not going to be evaluated if it's not necessary. For the in progress, we are doing the same. For done, we're doing the same. We're applying functions that are, well, coincidentally named in the same way as the type constructors here, but they are functions. And of course, if we pass these constructors as the parameters to the default function, we are going to get the identity function, but that's not what we want. Let's get back to the example of the completion function. So now we can implement it as a fold. And for the pending case, we're going to have a zero. For the in progress, we're going to have uh, identity, a function from int to int. And for done, we're going to ignore the input and return 100. And that's the same thing. We can structure our parameters in any way. It can be queried or in a single parameter list. It uh, doesn't really matter, but the fold function is a pattern and we have implemented that for our own sum type. So let's get to the next step. The next step is recursive types. So I'm going to implement a recursive type called content. So it's going to be either a video with a length and a link or a playlist that includes a list of content. All right, so it can be either a video or a playlist with multiple videos or more playlists. And I'm actually going to make it a non-empty list. That is going to come from cats. So let's define it. So if you remember the list case, we also had recursion. And in the fold of a list, every cons was replaced with a function that had an A and a B. And the A was the element of the list, and the B was the result of our, our fold, the, the, the type that we would eventually be returned uh, from the whole fold. Let's look at the fold of content. I'm going to have a case for video that's going to take a length, which is a finite duration, and the, the link, which is a string. And I'm going to return an A. So I'm also going to add an A parameter. And now I'm going to have a case for the playlist constructor. And that's going to go from a non-empty list of something to an A. And the whole result will be an A. Now, what could I possibly have in this non-empty list of something? I could have content in here, because that's what was there in the type, in the field. But that eventually would actually lead me to move the recursion part and thinking about how the structure looks like to the user of my fold function. The fold function should ideally not have any parameters or any functions with parameters of the original type. We are just going to destructure everything into that. So instead of content, we will have here a result of folding a content value. And the result of folding a content value is an A. So I'm going to replace all the content references in these parameters or in the fields of my types with an A. So here I'll have a non-empty list of A going to an A. And this is actually quite easy to implement again. I'm going to match on this. And for the video, I'm going to just call the video function. And for a playlist, I'm going to call the playlist function with elements, but elements are just a list of content, a non-empty list of content, and I need something else. I need a list of A's. So how do I map a content to an A? Turns out I can fold it with a video and a playlist function. And that will actually work. Now, this is not going to be stack safe. It's not the recursive. We have pretty much the same implementation as the fold write on a list because we are using the function on the top level and we have a recursion inside. If we go back to the fold write, that's exactly what we had here. But that's okay because 
how deep can a playlist be? And of course, it could be quite deep if we generate a deep enough value, but there are ways to make, make it the recursive. I'm not going to discuss them in this video, but there's a file in here that you can look at uh, that does it in a very manual way. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you're welcome to take a look. Basically, it boils down to implementing our own stack, like virtual stack, as a data structure. And it's going to have like stack frames. Basically, it's a simulation of whatever the JVM would do to put the values in the stack. And But we're basically moving all of that to the heap. There's an alternative implementation of this. We could use the eval type, but I'm also not going to talk about that today or any, any kind of trampolining technique would work. So let's just stick to this fold for, for now. So we implemented a fold for a recursive type. And what can we do with that? Like, why is this useful? There are several things we can do now on a uh, content value. We could count all the playlists in the value. So it's going to be a function from content to int. That could all actually be a non-negative int, but let's let's stick to standard types for now. So I'm going to fold, and if it's a video, I'm just going to return uh, zero. But if it's a playlist, I'm going to return one, and then the sum of whatever we had in the folding of the playlist, of, of the playlist elements. And that is probably not going to work, so I'm going to reduce left on this list. Okay, because that list, like if we had a structure like uh, a playlist with a video and then playlist with a video maybe, folding this to a playlist count would be one plus zero and one plus zero reduced with a plus, basically. So it would be like one plus zero plus one plus zero. So just one plus zero plus one plus zero equals two. And that's what we would get uh, for this data structure if we actually called this function on it. So just in case that wasn't clear, we are replacing every video in that structure with a zero and every playlist with a one plus and then sum of the values of the elements in there. So that's where the one plus and zeros come from. So there's other things we can do. We could maybe collect all the links in the, in the content or calculate the whole length of the playlist or the whole, the whole thing. So maybe length, that would be a finite duration as well. So I can fold starting from the duration of the of the video, and then I'm going to sum all the durations. And that's it. So this is how folding a recursive type would look like. It boils down to replacing all the references to the type itself in the in the functions here with the result of the folding that that we are doing, at least in the types. So we have another thing on our agenda, folding parameters types. So I'm going to make this real simple just because it's still quite a complex area and I'm not, I'm not going to uh, try to make this video too long. We're going to have a type uh, that's called message and it's going to be a message of A. So it's either going to be no content or some content with a string and A like a, a payload of A, and maybe another message, like a parent message, I don't know. It doesn't have to make sense, but it's going to be an option. So now it's both a parameterized type and a recursive type. So let's implement it. Okay, so let's implement the fold on it. We'll start with a type parameter because there's definitely going to be one. That's going to be the result of our fold. And now let's just do what we've always done. We'll replace all of the constructors of the type with functions or just values. So for the non -co no content case, we're going to have a no content 
uh, a binary value of type b. But if it's a content, we're going to have a string in the function, then an a and a parent. And the parent is going to be an option of a moment for you to think about it. And it's going to be a b. And the result will also be a b. So let's match on the type. So if it's a no content, we'll just have no content. Like this is the easy part, right? But if there is content, we will have an S, a payload, and a parent. And what we need to do now is, again, call the function called content with the S, with the payload. And now we need to replace the parent with the result of folding it. So we are going to map on it and fold with the same parameters. And that's it. This would work. This would compa this compiles and it would work. So that's how you can approach defining a fold method on any type in Scala or any any algebraic data type in Scala or any some type in, in Scala because it doesn't really make sense to fold on a case class. Uh, but I guess it's possible. So that's it for today's video. Just to sum up, we've learned what it means to fold using examples from the standard library. Then we implemented fold for a custom sum type, which was implemented as a sealed trait hierarchy. We implemented the fold on a recursive type that had references to its own type in one of the cases, and then a fold for a type with type parameters. So that's all for today. Thank you for watching and see you in the next episode.